Hello everyone, in this video we are going to focus on the pathophysiology of a very common surgical disease that is varicose veins. We are just going to focus on the pathogenesis, not only about varicose veins or which is called as something called as chronic venous insufficiency. So before we go to pathogenesis proper, let's focus on the brief anatomy of the venous system, mainly in the lower limbs. Because these diseases are very common in the lower limb, we are going to focus on that. So there are three sets of veins which are present in the lower limb. One is called the deep system, one is called the superficial system and one more is the venous system which is connecting these two, that is the perforators. So we'll consider the thinner one here as the superficial system, this one is the deep system and this here connecting the bridge is the perforators. One speciality of the venous system in the lower limbs are these venous system, both, all three of them, the deep, the superficial and the perforators all have one way valves in them. So these look something like this. The, pro, the uh, main purpose of these valves is they allow flow of venous uh, blood in only one direction. Okay, it's not the other way around. So what happens in the lower limbs in the venous system? Whenever the uh, patient starts walking or the person starts walking, that is called ambulation. At that time, because of the contraction of the calf muscles, mainly the gastrocnemius and the soleus, the blood flow occurs from the superficial system to the deep system through these perforator veins. And when the muscle contraction stops, even though they, normally there should occur flow in this direction, but because of the presence of the valves in this here, presence of valves in the perforators and the deep system and the superficial system, blood does not flow back. That is, once there is contraction, there is flow in this direction, in the perforator veins, and in the deep system, the flow occurs in this direction. Even in the superficial uh, system, the flow occurs in this direction, but more amount of blood flow is through the perforator into the deep system. And the, when the muscle contraction stops, the flow uh, should occur in this direction. But these walls which are present here, they close off. And once they close off, the flow of blood does not occur in the reverse direction. This is what happens in a normal venous system in the lower limb. So now, if these walls are incompetent due to some reason, it may be a genetic collagen vascular defect, it may be an acquired disease which has caused this, but these, vessel, uh, these walls become incompetent. At that moment, the flow is reversed. It flows from the deep system to the superficial system when these valves are incompetent. So the competency of the valves present in the venous system is a very important factor which, uh, which determines the development of a chronic venous insufficiency disease. So this is one of the pathogenesis. This is what happens if there is a reverse, reversal of the flow. One of the most common causes for the incompetence of these valves is the presence of a deep vein thrombosis if the patient has already suffered from a deep vein thrombosis in the past. So what happens? Again, we'll draw the same schematic diagram, deep system, perforator system, and a superficial system. Imagine a person who's had a previous history of deep vein thrombosis. So he would have come, previously he would have been treated for a disease where he had sudden onset, severe pain in the calf muscle which would have been more during walking and he would have had swelling of the lower limbs. Then he would have, there would have been a scan done, basically the Doppler scan and he would have been told there has been a clot and then he would have been put on drugs. So if this history is present in a patient of varicose veins, then you should think that that varicose veins is because of the post sequelae of a deep vein thrombosis history. So this is how you elicit a history of deep vein thrombosis in a patient of varicose veins. 
this limb where previously the patient had a DVT and now has come with sequelae or other consequences of that is called a post-phlebitic or a post-thrombotic limb. So this history, uh, eliciting of this history is very important in any patient who comes to you uh, with varicose veins. So imagine there was a, a clot here or in the deep, okay, we'll take a clot in the deep venous system, either here or here. So what happens, once the clot has been formed, he comes with history of all these, you diagnose, you treat. But during the uh, reversal or thrombolysis of this venous thrombosis which has been formed, there is a process called as recanalization. Recanalization. So this recanalization is, if this is the clot which is formed, through that a patency is being formed in long duration of course. So this is called recanalization. During the process of recanalization, these walls which are present here, they are destroyed. And because these walls are destroyed, again this leads to wall incompetence. This is one of the commonest causes of development of varicose veins. That is why in any patient with varicose veins, always do elicit a past history of suf having suffered from deep vein thrombosis. Some other causes for development of uh, uh, valvular incompetence in the venous system is it, it may be a genetic predisposition where there is collagen deficiency and the valves are not very strong enough to sustain this uh, pressure changes that occur in the veins during ambulation. That is why in these patients who have a genetic predisposition, family history is very important. And this family history, because of this genetic predisposition, these people develop varicose veins at a very younger age. And if they develop at a very young age, these are usually bilateral in nature. The disease is usually bilateral in nature. And if the patient is suffering from any other collagen disorder. Other things which are important is uh, any pelvic tumor, abdominal mass because that will also have an effect, pressure effect on the proximal venous system that will cause more pressure venous hypertension and leading to other sequelae of varicose veins. So now that we have a little bit basis about the pathophysiology, let's focus on a few more points related to varicose veins. So what happens, what is the meaning of the word varicose? Varicose basically means tortuous. So instead of the vein being like this, it goes haywire. It, it's like, it looks something like this. It's dilated and it's tortuous. So varicose veins are though, according to definition, varicose veins are those veins which are dilated, tortuous and have diameter more than 3 mm. So why is this point important that it's more than 3 mm? Is? Because if they're less than 1 mm, they are called as thready veins. Okay, If they are between 1 and 3 mm, they are called reticular veins. And only if they are greater than 3 mm, they are varicose veins. So why, why should we focus so much on, the, on this varicose veins? It's just dilatation and tortuosity. But these varicose veins have a sequelae. They have effects because of which other problems develop if you leave them untreated. So what is that? So whenever there is uh, now valvular incompetence is there and the veins have become dilated and tortuous. So whenever there is valvular incompetence, what happens? All the uh, Instead of going into the system, uh, back to the heart, these, this blood remains back in the venous system. So there is vascular stasis. Once there is stasis, see if this is the vessel and there is stasis of blood here, because of that, there is increased pressure which is exerted on this venous wall. And as you can remember, the wall of the vein is very thin when compared to the wall of the artery. Because the tunica media is very thin when compared to the artery. So this is called as, because of stasis, there is increased pressure on the wall. That is called as venous hypertension. And this venous hypertension is more predominant whenever the patient is walking. This is called ambulatory venous hypertension. Okay, ambulatory venous hypertension. Once that occurs, 
endothelial damage occurs in this region of the venous wall and because of that the rbcs which are present in the blood they diffuse into the surrounding tissue and once they diffuse into the surrounding tissue instead of being whole rbc they will get lysed okay because they cannot sustain the pressure which is there in the surrounding tissue and once these get lysed the hemos uh, hemosiderin which is there inside the rbc basically the hemoglobin but this will be converted into hemosiderin and this will get deposited in the subcutaneous plane or the connective tissue which is present below the skin and because this acts as a foreign body it's not naturally seen in that part of the body it will induce inflammation of the skin under the skin of the skin and this we call it as dermatitis and once there is inflammation what happens in long standing cases it leads to fibrosis because of stimulation of the, all the fibroblasts and if this occurs in that area of the lower limb this fibrosis forms something it causes hypoxia local hypoxia and if there is hypoxia the cell death starts there and leading to a venous ulcer so all these things can occur if you leave these varicose veins untreated and once the venous ulcer develops it's very hard difficult to treat all these ulcers and venous ulcer if left untreated there is very high there is a chance that it can turn into a malignant ulcer which is nothing but a marjolin's ulcer one more point here is that this dermatitis which occurs in the venous uh, system is called as lipodermato sclerosis because there's lot of fibrosis going on and uh, dermat so this is what happens if varicose veins are left untreated hope this video was useful we'll focus on some more points related to varicose veins in the next videos thanks for watching